and a little different. <clears throat> so we're going to look at other wave functions in one-dimensional systems and their quantized energy equations. Okay. And so we've been talking about the particle in a one-dimensional box. This is a nice, easy, easy system to visualize because it's just an x-axis. It's kind of like the De Broglie's original guitar string or violin string. So we can think of this wave very easily as a taut string. Uh, but what if we took that and wrapped it around a ring? Okay. Uh, well, first, <laughs> sometimes you see in classes that they go from a one-dimensional box to a two-dimensional box. So I just wanted to show you some of these really nice videos uh, talking about this. This is a picture out of the Atkins textbook. Wow. It's not on. Okay, show screen. <laughs> How about that? You didn't tell me sooner than that. Yo, still not. Okay, laptop. Hmm. This. Yeah, unplug it and pull it back in. Yay, okay. So like I said, this was the um, the par particle in the box. Like I said, it looks very much like a string with different harmonics. It gives us the standing waves. It gives us the higher quantized frequencies. We see the same thing with the two-dimensional system. And this can be seen as, instead of a string, a drum head. Okay. And this uh, person here on YouTube is driving this um, this diaphragm with a speaker and so he's tuning in various uh, uh, frequencies and causing this uh, drum head to oscillate so it's very similar to the particle in a in a one-dimensional box wave function but now we just have x and y and you just take the multi the, the wave functions and multiply them by each other and so this is an important point the overall wave function is always the product of individual wave functions so we can we can remember that so psi total is equal to psi 1 times psi 2. Uh, I'll say, let's say vibro vibration, rotation, electronic, nuclear. So let's go ahead and apply it to molecules. You know, we have an electronic wave function and a nuclear wave function and a rotational wave function and a vibrational wave function. And we could have a translational wave function, but the the translational energy differences are so small because we're in big boxes like this room that they're not detectable so we can't see the quantum effects of translation but there would be a translational wave function and that translational wave function would be the particle in a box in a three-dimensional box but our box length is so big that the energy levels are touching almost <laughs> there's no way to do, to um, use spectroscopy to get to them okay but there would be a translational wave function. And in fact, in, in thermodynamics, we calculate the particle in a box as our translational wave function. And that's where most of our energy is stored, is in translation, kinetic energy of gases. Right. And so we can get the, the thermodynamic properties just thinking about the translation as a particle in a box. So let's look at this video here. <coughs> It is the lowest frequency vibrational pattern in a circular membrane. This circular membrane is a piece of dentist rubber dam stretched over a short length of PVC pipe and held in place with some rubber bands. And this lowest pattern, the entire membrane moves up and down together as one piece. The whole thing moves together. Here's the second pattern for the same membrane. It occurs at a little bit higher frequency. Half of the membrane moves up while the other half is moving down, and there's a line right across the diameter of the that? node yeah. that so doesn't do vibrate at all. Here's the third pattern membrane. There are two sections, actually, it's kind of like a cloverleaf pattern. Two opposite sides of the membrane move up and together, and the adjacent sections move down. So there's four regions that move alternating up and down. Here's the fourth pattern. The center of the membrane moves opposite the up. So I wanted to stop edge. that. I can't pause it. And there's a circle. So that those stupid pictures uh, come doesn't up. move at all. 
Let me do this. Okay. Ah, I stopped it right on a node. Darn it. I can't. It will stop when it's flat. But, but if you'll notice that the middle is up while the outer ring is down, and it looks like this. If I were to, if I were to draw draw it, it would be a center part that's say shaded, and an outer part that's not. And sometime later, the center part's not, and the outer part's shaded. And that's very similar to a 2s orbital. This would be like a 1s. So in three dimensions, a 1s expanding in all directions, but in in uh, and that you go up one principal quantum number, and now you have a radial node inside. And so the middle of it is expanding a little bit while the outside's compressing, and then the outside's expanding while the inside's compressing. Okay. So we're seeing this in terms of two dimensions but it's very similar to what we see in three dimensions with our atomic orbitals, okay? And we can see the frequencies go up too. The, this lowest one was 82. I don't know what he's got here, if it's kilohertz. It, I mean, it is kind of, uh, um, we hear something, but I'm not sure if it's below or above our, our hearing, maybe it's hertz. So since I can't see the units on there, I'm just gonna leave them off. But this is 82, this was 158 much higher in, in, in frequency, and this was 217, okay, those resonances. And so those would be the resonances of those wave functions. And for us to cause a transition, we would need to hit it with a frequency difference between 158 and 82 to get it to jump, okay. And that, that, that energy that we put in would have to have the correct symmetry, and we'll see today or tomorrow, or next time, I should say. <clears throat> Here's another one that's a higher frequency just for the pretty pictures. So, uh, so this is uh, interesting to watch. They just have this plate. This is so dramatic. He's measuring in hertz, okay. So. so it puts salt on this metal plate and then starts driving the plate with a tone generator. And then the salt crystals are gonna avoid the lobes because the lobes are moving and so they're gonna move to the nodes. And so the salt crystals are gonna move to wherever the nodes are. <laughs> and it makes that shape because it's a square instead of a circle. Yeah, and it it's makes that shape too because it's driven in the middle yeah. too. And so this, this plate is vibrating all these different uh, patterns. So those are the nodes. Now what's amazing is these are macroscopic objects. This is a metal plate, okay? But the electron cloud behaves a similar way, okay? So the math associated with these resonances is the same math we can use for atomic orbitals, for vibrations, and so on. So we knew the math for these kinds of shapes and in these kinds of oscillations. I mean, you saw Tesla. I mean, this goes pretty far back. But we knew all of these kinds of mathematical equations. And, and if we could do this to a sphere somehow, I don't know, maybe magnetic particles or something on a sphere, a metal sphere, and shake it, we would see the nodes for the p orbital and then we would see the nodes for the d orbitals. And we would see like a band around the middle for the dz orbital with, you know, and so we would be able to see those same kind of nodes. Uh, but I don't exactly know how to suspend the sphere, maybe with a magnetic field or something and magnetic particles and then some speakers. Um, but that would be the spherical harmonics. And the functions that govern the spherical harmonics are the, go the solutions to the Schrodinger equation for the orbital angular momentum, okay? So it was the same math that they used for the harmonics of the sphere that they used for the spherical electronic cloud. Okay. So anyway, this is kind of fun stuff. It's just, um, but it, it, you see as we, we're much, much higher frequency on that plate. So we have nodes everywhere and, and you're starting to see some of the imperfections in the, in the exact balance of where that driver is.
so that's a that was a two-dimensional system let's go back to a one-dimensional system it starts as a two-dimensional system and x and y it's a ring but then we can model that x and y we can transform that over to the angle to the angle of rotation or theta um, we're going to set this as going from minus um, pi to positive pi so that we have it centered on zero here. And so if we take this ring and we unzip it and we look at that, um, you know, we might have like a cosine. And so cosine of zero here, you know, is one. If we go forward to pi, it goes to minus one. If we go backwards to negative pi, it goes to minus one. And it, importantly, it meets up, you know, at positive pi, it's now back to the other side of the ring, and it meets up. And so this would be um, for the quantum number n equals 1. This would be the same one you get for n equals minus 1, or, or yeah, n equals minus 1. And we'll see how n equals plus 1 and minus 1 are equivalent in their real part, but not equivalent in their imaginary part. Okay. So one way to visualize this wave function is to look down at the top of the ring and kind of look at where these nodes are. So these nodes here. And so if we look down on the ring here, the n equals zero is the same value all the way around. It's just a constant. If we look at the, um, the wave function here and we put n equals zero here, we end up with uh, e to the zero. So this becomes one and the wave function is essentially you know, the square root of 1 over 2 pi. And so it's a constant value all the way around. Um, if we put a, a 1 here, either plus 1 or a minus 1, we end up with the real part being a cosine. And so if this is, like if this is 0 here, you know, it's positive going around to minus pi and plus pi, plus or minus pi here. And so we're drawing that node across the middle. Because it's positive, it crosses zero and goes negative over here. Or it's positive going backwards, crosses zero and is negative over here. You see that down here, the same thing? We've taken, we've taken this cosine and we kind of wrapped it around the ring. And then this node in the middle shows us we have a positive side and the negative side. And then n equals two, it gets more complex. We have two nodes. n equals three, we have three nodes. You say it looks like six, but it's really not. It's, it's one two, three, and if I get over here, that's the same as one. So n equals three is three nodes, n equals four is four nodes. One, two, three, four, and then we're back to the same one. n equals five, one, two, three, four, five. Okay. Now, how is this related to a ring? Well, I've got a pretty well-made ring here, <laughs> okay? My wedding ring, and I'm gonna put it in Perhaps, I don't exactly know because I can't visualize it, but I think if I hit it on the side, I'll get the resonance of n equals 1 because I'm deforming the ring on one side and providing an up-down motion. So listen to this. You hear the vibration? That's this n equals 1 oscillation. So these are not just cosines. These are actually resonances in the ring. So this plus 1 can go can expand in all directions and then shrink in all directions. So the n equals zero has got no angular dependence at all. It's just expanding and contracting in all directions. So think about what we're, we're analyzing. Remember the particle in a box was like a guitar string, the wave, right? We didn't know exactly where the particle was. We had to square the wave function to get the probability of finding the particle. But we're describing it as a vibrating ring. Well, what is a particle on a ring? That particle's not somewhere on the ring orbiting. The ring is the particle. <laughs> and in the ground state, it's equal probable of finding it anywhere in that space. Okay, But the particle's behaving like a wave. It's oscillating like this in the ground state. Now, if you were to collapse its wave function and force it to come off of the ring, you'd have an equal probability of shooting it anywhere on the ring. Okay, it's smeared across the whole ring. Okay. But if it's in the n equals one state, then you know it could be above or below because I just put this up and down thing. So if I, this is the image of the n equals one state where 
it's um it's oscillating left and right you see the plus and minus that's sort of an expansion in the in the plus side let me go back so that we can map it see this green here is the plus so it's it's a snapshot of the particle in a ring this plus means it's expanded over here and the minus means it's contracted over here and then sometime later because the schrodinger equation is time dependent right sometime later it goes through the imaginary plane and now it's in the negative real plane and so it's pointing in the opposite direction. So the pluses and minuses switch sign. And then it moves through the negative imaginary plane and ends up in the positive real plane. So it's it's kind of rotating in and out of the real and imaginary and the positive and negative reals and the positive and negative imaginaries, but it's moving left and right, if you will. If we square that wave function, then we see that it's uh, wherever there's motion, that's the probability of the location of that particle. So if we square it, we really don't have any probability of finding that particle on the top part of the ring or the bottom part of the ring. All the probabilities on the left and the right of the ring. Now, why is that? I don't know. That's one of the postulates of quantum mechanics. It's unproven. It's just given to us that the square of the wave function tells us where the particle is. And the wave function's um, energy is, is related to the curvature of the wave function, the kinetic energy. So where the wave function curves, that's where the particle is. Where the wave function is at the node, it's probably not there, okay? So it's, it's where the wave function's doing something is where the particle is. So in that case, it's left and right in my little green and red pictures up here. See, it's moving left and right. So if we square that wave function, that's where the action is. That's where the particle's gonna be. Notice that we're the lowest quantum states, and so the quantum effects are the highest, meaning there's places where you're probably not gonna find a particle ever. You know, if you could fix that ring in space and fix a, a target like a beam of electrons or something to hit that guy out of there, aiming at the top of the ring is not gonna yield much signal. Aiming at the side of the ring will yield your signal. But it's so hard to control a system that small, that carefully, okay? But that's where the quantum effects would be the strongest, would be down around the ground state. Notice as we get up to N equals five, particles everywhere again, <laughs> okay? And then this one is, uh, again, it's bulging, you know, here on the, where it's positive, it's bulging out. And where it's negative, it's, it's not bulging out. It's kind of contracting. And so I've done my best to kind of make an animation. This is why I'm getting the notes out so slowly is because I'm building all these little things. <laughs> it took me hours. <laughs> so, so it, you know, I kind of, I know it can be frustrating. You're like, I want the notes. I'm like, I know I want you to want the notes and I want to give them to you. <laughs> Making all these little things, uh, all my little fun pictures is a bit tedious. So that's why I stopped at N equals two. I couldn't figure out how. <laughs> it got ridiculous after that. So I said, okay, we'll just stop here. But you got the idea, yeah. right? Yeah. And it's the resonance of a ring. So when we get to an atom, it's the resonance of a sphere. Okay. So... Hopefully in this course, when you start thinking now about these resonances and these wave functions, you can understand when we take a, a sphere, and I'm gonna kind of draw an equator here, right? And if I, if I make it bulge at the top, so it's coming out at the top, right? And it's going in at the bottom. Okay, but the equator is not moving, okay? And if I plot that around an axis, I'm going to plot where it got big on top and where it got small on bottom. And I'm going to put a minus sign there because it got smaller and I get a P orbital. That's the resonance of that electron cloud. It's puffing up and down the Z axis. That's what a PZ orbital is doing. So now you don't have to think about the P orbital and go, is the electron here? How does it get through the nucleus and so on? It's not orbiting around that P orbital shape. Yeah, it's the oscillation of the sphere, the electron cloud. So it's on both sides of the nucleus all the time because it's a wave. Yeah, is there a way? This is this is what quantum mechanics is. It's describing all of nature as a wave. So it, we're we're mapping the deflection of the cloud with all of these p and d orbitals and f orbitals. 
So this is always a fun part because I think very few people think about orbitals that way. And of course, where they're moving, that's where they are. So a PZ orbital can bond in the Z direction. And a PX orbital can bond in the X direction because it's oscillating in those directions and can really overlap in those directions. That's where it's interacting. It's not interacting where the nodes are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, let's now go through the math related to the particle on a ring. Uh, this is the normalization. It's super easy because we just had the normalization constant in front. It's e to the i n phi times e to the minus i n phi because the complex conjugate. So this is uh, the you know particle on, in a box. We didn't have an imaginary wave function. This time we do, and so that causes this minus sign right here. Okay, and that's what makes this the easiest integral you'll ever do. It's the e to the zero d phi or d, d theta, and uh, and so then you evaluate that at, at pi and minus pi, and so you have minus the minus pi, and, and so this is really easy. We, our normalization constant is the square root of one over two pi. So that's where the when we have a normalized wave function. Let's think about quantum numbers. Okay. For the particle in a box, we started at n equals 1, and it was a sine function. Um, let's see, n equals, yeah, if, if you go uh, to n equals minus 1, then it'll flip the sine of the pi, and you're going uh, in the other direction, and you end up flipping the sine of sine. And so n equals minus 1 will give you exactly the same wave as n equals 1. And so it was redundant to have plus or minus one, plus or minus two, plus or minus three for the particle in a box. N equals zero, uh, zeroed out the wave function. And so there was no constant left after you zero out the, wave, the sign. If you zero out, zero out e to the x, you still have a constant in front. It equals one. But if you zero, put zero in sign, you get zero. And so N equals zero was out. So for a particle in a box, we just have one, two, three, four, all the way up to infinity for our quantum numbers. But for a particle on a ring, zero is a valid quantum number. Okay, let's talk about plus or minus one though. So here's, uh, if our wave function is e to the plus i n phi, what about if we use a negative quantum number? Like instead of plus one, we use minus one. So let's let n prime equal negative n and so we put those in here. So now is in is this wave function different or the same as this one up here? Let's go ahead and, and clean this up. We have minus n in place of n in all these places. This is using Euler's formula. And so let's let's look at at this piece here. If we have a, a minus n inside here, um, if you go in the opposite direction with sine, it's just the opposite sine of that same function. And so this is this is fine. So for this piece right here, we can simplify it with this. Okay. And then let's look at the cosine. If we have a if we change the sine inside the argument, it doesn't do anything to the cosine. And so this piece right here can be substituted with that. And so when we look at this, we see the only difference with our quantum number is in the imaginary part. So changing the, the uh, quantum number from plus one to minus one or plus two to minus two only changes the imaginary part. But that is different. So we're gonna keep the plus and minus uh, um, quantum numbers. So because the, the, the negative version or the, the wave function with negative uh, quantum numbers is different than the wave function with positive quantum numbers, we're going to keep, we have to keep both positive and negative quantum numbers in rotation. And the way we think about this is that, that notice uh, in one situation it's it's cosine plus I sine theta, in the other situation it's cosine minus I sine theta. Uh, that just creates um, either the, the imaginary part being in front of the wave or behind the wave. So the real part might be uh, in front of the imaginary part or behind the imaginary part. I could probably draw it on this uh, previous slide. Let me just go back and show that. So if I did, um, this would be the imaginary part, plus I sine theta, right? 
And if I did uh, minus I sine theta, it would be like this, minus I sine theta. So do you see here's the real part, and it's either um, in front of the imaginary part or behind the imaginary part. And so we can see this as rotation. Let's say the imaginary part always follows the real part. And so it's either, if it's, if it's uh, in this situation here, then it's rotating this direction because it's real then imaginary. If it's here, if we're using the, the, the negative quantum number, then it's real and imaginary and it's rotating this direction. Yeah, so they're just going in different directions. That's the way this is commonly understood. Um, so if that confused you, you can go back and watch the video but the, the common uh, understanding is that the positive and negative wave functions really are understood as either clockwise or counterclockwise rotation. But the zero is in plus or minus zero because it's, it's in all directions. You have, yeah, it's just expanding out and, and back. There really seems to be no rotation at quantum number equals zero. Okay, let's solve for the energies. So this is also very easy because we're just taking the derivative of e to the x, okay? I just used the minus one here, so e to the minus i n phi theta. I keep saying phi. So we do the first derivative, and those coefficients of theta come out front here. We do the second derivative. They come out front again. And they're squared. And this is beautiful because i squared is minus 1. And that's minus one, cancels this minus one, and we have real and positive energies. <laughs> okay, so that's nice. Yeah, so here we have our energy equation. It looks very similar to the particle in a box. Yeah, except instead of uh, the, the length of the box, we have r squared, so the radius of the ring, and we have a pi in here. So as you might imagine, it's a rotational system, so we have some pi in there. And the quantum number squared. Yes, and the quantum number squared. Yeah. We can do the um, we can do the transition equations. So I didn't show all the algebra on these. You could do those for fun. <laughs> all right. But look, it's very similar to the particle in a box. Okay. So all these one dimensional systems are very, very similar. Okay. Uh, there's a there's another factor of two in here for the energy and the frequency. We have uh, another factor of two down here too, and um, and the in fact I could probably cancel those you know just to make it look a little cleaner. And we have the pi squared. Okay, so I could have I could have cleaned that up a little bit better. All right, and actually I think I think this is wrong. I'm, I made a mistake here. This is the one still the one over that. I remember pulling that out of the denominator and I did it wrong. So put it, be sure to correct that on the wavelength, okay? It's one over n plus a half, just like the particle in the box. It's amazing how you don't catch your errors until you're presenting. <laughs> All right. So let's think about the transition dipole moment integral. This was a little more difficult. Uh, think about how light's going to interact with this system. So in this case, I've kind of shown uh, this this y-axis here. So if light's coming in along this axis, and I take a snapshot, you know, you've got a positive end here and a negative end here and kind of a node in the middle. So it looks just like cosine. So light is cosine in this rotational system. So instead of using x to represent light, we have a rotational system, and we have to map plane polarized light onto this rotational system. So it's coming in oscillating on this ring, and it's going to perturb that ring with its, with its electric field along that direction. So you can look at this, and you can kind of think of that this oscillating electric field, positive and negative, on that ring. And it's going to have the same symmetry as cosine theta. And so we'll just come in and put cosine theta here in the middle. This is light. And so we have light in the middle here. We have N plus delta N and N. 
and the complex conjugate, so we change the sign. So we have all of those pieces in here, integrate over all space, which is going to be minus pi to positive pi. And it is quite a long result. There's like four major terms here. And a lot of them are zero. We'd have this cosine term. And the, the problem with the cosine term is it's a difference in cosines. And, and cosine is symmetric. So this negative sign really doesn't matter, positive and negative pi, because it's symmetric. And so everything's going to go to zero. So this predicts that there are no transitions for particle on a ring, we know that's not the case. We know that rotational systems can absorb light. But there are some special cases here. You see in the red, um, this blows up when delta n equals plus or minus one. So when delta n is equal to one plus one, this goes to infinity. And when delta n is minus one, this goes to infinity. And we have cosine, essentially cosine of u over u and that goes to infinity, positive infinity, if you approach it from positive, the positive direction. It goes to minus infinity if you approach it from the negative direction. And so that limit's undefined. You know, like uh, sine u over u is, is one. You can do L'Hopital's rule and take the slope of the, the derivative of the numerator and the denominator, and you can see it converges to one. But in this case, because the infinities are in opposite directions, it's undefined. So we have a problem with the general solution. Uh, so the cosines blow up when delta n is plus or minus one, and it may be the result of trying to solve this for all delta n's. So we went back and solved it for just plus or minus one specifically. So here's the, the um, solution for, for that with some steps missing. So we have the same setup, only we have n is plus or minus one here instead of plus or minus delta n. Um, we have the complex conjugate and cosine for light. We did Euler's uh, um, formula, substitution. And with that substitution, we end up with this piece right here, cosine squared piece. And that allows us to do that, you know, um, uh, that one plus one half uh, uh, sign stuff. So that this this gives us this term right here, which does not disappear. And when we evaluate that at um, pi at pi and negative pi, we end up with a constant value one half. So for transitions of plus or minus one, they are allowed in the ring. So the only term that survives comes from a cosine squared term, and that only happens when you have delta n of plus or minus one. If you have plus or minus two, that n is inside the cosine, so it's the, you know n times theta, and you'll never get a cosine squared term. You'll always have a cos two theta times a cos one theta or something like that, and you would have this um, differences of cosines, and 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 so no other case will give uh, a non-zero result except for delta n plus or minus one. Now, this seems like a, a very long discussion, and that's why I think in, in, in all of our historical discussions in PCHEM, we just focus on the angular momentum of light, and we say light has one unit of angular momentum. And so in a rotating system, it can impart that angular momentum to the rotating system and increase its angular momentum or even decrease it, but only by one unit, because light has one unit of angular momentum. But notice in this course, we haven't done anything with angular momentum. So to then just grab that out of the blue and stick it in here as an argument, I think is weak, okay? We did the particle in a box uh, wave function, analyzed its uh, uh, selection rules with calculus, analytical calculus. We should be able to do the same thing for the particle on a ring, and we can. So this delta n plus or minus one, it can be shown in the calculus as the only non-zero result. So that's, um, again, that was a contribution of one of my master's students just a few years back. So this is our selection rule. And then we have um, the uh, transition, I mean, the, uh, yeah, the transition dipole moment integral is strange. It's just a constant value. So it's a constant probability. If you've got molecules in that state, 
They've got it's like a 50-50 chance <laughs> of absorbing or not. <laughs> only up one unit or only down one unit. They can emit light by one quantum state or absorb light by one state and you flip a coin whether they're going to go or not. <laughs> so it's kind of an interesting result. Yeah. So it's totally governed by the Boltzmann distribution and the degeneracy if you have multiple levels like a, you know, um, we'll see in three dimensions there's a degeneracy component. And so, so this is our particle on a ring, and it's relevant to rotation. Let's talk about vibration now. So, changing gears, let's look at the vibrational motion. And this is where we stop doing it analytically. I mean, it can be done, but it's, oh goodness, look at the wave function, okay? The harmonic oscillator again, now we have a, now we have a potential energy surface, we have this, um, Hooke's law, this this para parabolic potential energy. You know, here's the center of the you know displacement, so this object's vibrating back and forth. And you have a normalization constant times a polynomial times a Gaussian. So these are the solutions um, to the Schrodinger equation for vibrational motion. Here's our normalization constant. It has this term alpha in it, which is where the mass is, the spring constant for the vibration. Planck's constant, etc. Um, there were so many units of X over alpha, all of these things that they just decided to simplify it. They simplified all these constants in a constant alpha, and then it's always X divided by that, so they call that Y. And so they have this Hermite polynomial, which is a function of Y, and then this Gaussian function, which has Y in the numerator. So. I don't know that I could fit it all on the page if I put all these constants in. Yeah. yeah. And here's the polynomials in front. So these these are solutions to the second order differential equation here. Where the primes and double primes are first derivative and second derivative of this polynomial. Okay. So the vibrational motion is a real bear. Okay. If you go on to PhD school and you're taking quantum mechanics, you're probably going to do this one as a homework set, you know? <laughs> so anyway, um, so, so then, but what's interesting is you do all of this with the wave functions and you solve the Schrodinger equation and look at the energy equation. That's the energy equation for vibrational motion. After all of that, and it looks a lot like our particle in a box and our particle on a ring. I mean, these are very, very relevant systems, and that's why we use them so much. We we try if we can simplify things and call it a particle on a on a on a wire or particle in a box or particle on a ring. We will, um, if we can do vibrational motion and treat it like vibration. We will notice that that a particle in a box is just a severe case of this. It's it's just hard walls. And that makes it really simple to say it's zero potential in the middle and then vertical walls straight up. Okay. And then the harmonic oscillator just makes those walls squishy. Okay. Makes them soft. So they come in and it's confined by this soft barrier. And just making that wall soft uh, allows all of this other complexity to come in. But the wave functions still look very similar. You have the ground state wave function. The first excited state has one node, the second has two nodes, the third has three nodes. So it's very familiar results that you might see. Also this frequency of vibration in the energy equation is right here, and that has the spring constant and the mass. So once again, mass is in the denominator of energy. As mass goes up, energy goes down. Okay. This spring constant here, as the spring constant goes up, you have a narrower box. So as K goes up, energy goes up. Okay. And now it comes with compression of the spring, right? Yeah, so it's a tighter spring, and so it oscillates very small amounts. It takes a lot of energy to pull on a tight spring. And if it's a really weak K, then you have a really long oscillation, so a bigger box, if you will, but it's a loose spring or a smaller K. And so as K goes down, energy goes down. 
And so the energy levels for this red one might be, might be like this. Okay, see the red one, the energies are further apart because it's a smaller box. One other thing is notice that the energy levels are equally spaced. Okay. And so this ground state energy is one half because if n, n equals zero, okay, so the quantum numbers can be zero and go on up to infinity. So uh, if the quantum number is zero, then it's zero plus a half times h nu. And then if it's one, it goes up to one and a half or three halves. So this delta here is equal to h nu. And this delta is equal to h nu. So it's just Planck's constant times the vibrational frequency to give you that energy difference in joules. So let's look at those uh, energy equations. Basically what I just did or said was is all here on the, on the screen. The KF is the force constant. Um, a lot of times we use reduced mass because it's not just a single mass moving. It's a bunch of different masses moving. But all vibration can be described in terms of normal modes of vibration. And even though I might be moving all five of my fingers out, I can combine all of those lengths and, and combine that into one variable and use the harmonic oscillator for it because they all go out together and they all come in together. So it could be quite a complex motion that's still one dimensional. They're either going out or they're going in. And there's one spring constant and there's one frequency. And that's different than this one, okay? The asymmetric stretch. Lots of motion there, but it's either going in this direction or going in that direction. So it's still one dimensional, even though there's five different things changing. So in a molecule, you might have half the molecule going left and the other half going right, and it's still a one-dimensional system. It's still vibrational, harmonic oscillator. So that is wonderful. Think about how simple that is. No matter how comp DNA is doing its thing, right? It's still one dimension. It's vibration for its normal mode of vibration, like the twist of DNA. That could be a normal mode of vibration. And all of those atoms are moving but they go to a certain distance and they stop and turn around and go the other way. And it's just one dimension. Those are called normal modes of vibration. Okay, now they might not be totally harmonic. So they might be anharmonic. In other words, if you stretch a bond far enough, it breaks, right? And so you can dissociate bonds and that means that the energy levels are no longer equally spaced. They compress and get closer together. And so we might wanna subtract something from our energy equation to take into account and harmonicity, and meaning not, so it's not harmonic. Okay. And so this is the anharmonicity constant, and that's the quadratic, and here's the cubic anharmonicity constant. So typically when you're doing a polynomial expansion, you subtract something, and then it, it at higher order, uh, quantum numbers, you're subtracting too much. And so then you add something back in to correct the overcorrection. <laughs> and so you just, they call it HOT, higher order terms. <laughs> and you just keep expanding and expanding and putting, putting in these little uh, factors in here that are just totally empirically derived. So there's nothing special about XE or YE, uh, except they're just a polynomial fit to the experimental data. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's the frequency equation with the inharmonicity terms, and so the selection rules really difficult to do if you think about those wave functions. And so I'm just giving them to you; they're plus or minus one. But if you take into account inharmonicity, uh, they allow plus or minus two, plus or minus three, and so on. The transition equation. It's very simple. It's just however many changes you have in energy level times HC nu. Uh, one note here, this little tilde, that's um, <clears throat> tilde is one over the wavelength in centimeters. Okay. And so we call that wave numbers.
And we're talking about energy here too. So HC just converts that from inverse centimeters to joules. Okay. Sometimes you will see it without the HC. It'll just be this. And they'll just talk about energy in terms of wave numbers. But wave numbers really isn't an energy term. You just, to get that to joules, you multiply by Planck's constant and the speed of light, okay? But I just want you to know that sometimes you can get confused. I'll talk about energy and I'll say wave numbers, but it's just because it's a convenient um, way to talk about it. Yeah, just multiply by Planck's constant and the speed of light if you want joules. If you want joules per mole, multiply by Avogadro's number as well, and you'll get the per mole part. Um, so that anharmonicity allows those overtones. Uh, here's the transition equation with the first anharmonicity term. Okay, so it gets, it gets pretty busy. So here's the setup. I've got the HC nu and HC um, with the XE term, just with the first uh, quadratic term. And then I've done the algebra elsewhere and it gives this result. So it's still, the major term is this HC nu times delta N, and then there's a small adjustment for the overtones with this anharmonicity constant. <clears throat> the transition dipole moment integral is not straightforward <laughs> because this is no longer just um, a single particle on a wire, okay, or a single particle on a ring. This is the change in the dipole moment or the polarizability as the thing vibrates, okay? So if my fingers were charged, how does the dipole moment on my hand change when my charges move? And they're moving in all directions and so on. So it's really difficult to do. And, and the same with um, polarizability. So the size of the electron cloud changes a lot when my fingers move for this one, but for this one, not so much. So the, the area that my hand takes up doesn't change much when I'm doing this, but when I'm doing that, the area changes a lot. And those kinds of integrals are really difficult, okay? Um, but Gaussian can do it. <laughs> so, so we'll do that in our calculations. Does that include row vibration whenever it um, expands out? Yeah, so the, the row part would be the rotational wave yeah. functions, and they would have its own transition equation, and then the vibrational part would have its transition yeah. equation, yeah. Okay. yeah. So just to look at some other linear systems like the vibration and, and the, um, the drum head, the, the two-dimensional systems. So hopefully uh, we will start getting into more of the calculating with Gaussian and doing some of these uh, kinds of intensity and, and transition wavelength calculations with the software.